So welcome everyone, good morning. Um, so today it's going to be a little bit of an introduction to computational linguistics and also a little bit how this might relate to speech and voice assistants in general. If you've already downloaded my slides before, please do so again because I updated them and shortened them yesterday night. So please download the latest version. So my title is Dialogue or Dialogue, so I will also talk a little bit about uh, language variety and domain specific contents in this context. As uh, my dear colleague already said, um, my background is in linguistics and computer science, so for me it was only natural to bring both of this somehow together in form of computational linguistics in research and in my life. What I'm going to do today is first give all of you who are not from a linguistic background a mini, 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 mini crash course <laughs> on linguistics and what's important in linguistics. Then I will talk a little bit about what's the difference between NLP and computational linguistics because those two are frequently used. <coughs> I'm sorry. I will give a very short introduction into traditional uh, natural language processing and then talk about advances in computational linguistics with a particular focus on machine translation but also conversational agents. And finally, I will talk about some limitations in terms of domain and variety specific computational linguistics. So let's get started with our mini, mini, mini crash course. <laughs> um, phonetics is one very important area of linguistics. It's about the study of the physical aspects of how sounds are produced, of how speech is produced in general, and how we comprehend speech. So it's both, it's the vocal cords and the vocal production system, but also the auditory part of it. Phonology, on the other hand, tries to systemize the whole thing. It tries to systematically organize sounds and languages. When you transcribe something, when you transcribe speech in some way, that's usually related to phonology and phonetics. So for instance, the English P sound can be aspirated as in pot, where you hear the H somehow, the aspiration pot. Whereas uh, if you talk about spot and you listen to that P, there's no P, it's just P, you know? So those are, for instance, things that people in phonetics, uh, in phonology, sorry, study. Morphology looks at the smallest units of meaning in language. So if you think about uh, prefixes, something like uh, un, it makes a huge difference to a word. So if you say happy, it's very positive, but if you add un to it, it becomes unhappy. So un has a meaning somehow. Uh, also English past tense, for instance, is formed with ed. So it changes talk as in now to talk as in past tense. Then the holy trinity of linguistics is syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Those are the three big things that are being studied. Syntax looks at structure, sentence structure, language structure. It can also be beyond sentences, but usually it focuses on sentences. It's basically grammar. So you say a noun phrase is something that's frequently used as a subject in a sentence, and then it's usually followed by something like a verb. That would be um, grammar, basic grammar. Semantics studies meaning, but not just any meaning, but very the literal meaning of language. So if you look at the sentence, each of us saw her duck, it can either be her duck in the sense of her pet, or it can be the motion of, you know, ducking. So this is very ambiguous, and this is something that semantics is interested in. Pragmatics also studies meaning, but there's a huge difference. Pragmatics looks at uh, meaning in context, applied meaning. There's something like explicature or implicature. You can imply meaning, you can say, let's go to the movies tonight, and then the other person responds, it's raining. If you look at this literally, it's raining is not a reply to the question or to the su suggestion, let's go to the movies. This is implied meaning. It's like, I don't want to go outside because it's raining, let's stay inside, okay? So all of this is implied by just saying it's raining. This is pragmatics. It also looks at something like performative utterances. Um, I can do something by saying something. If a policeman arrests someone and doesn't say you are arrested, it doesn't have any effect. So you need to say the words in order to do the act. If you want to marry two people, you also need to say, I hereby declare you married. Otherwise, the whole action is not valid. Those are performative utterances. So the language really does something. So all of this is pragmatics. 
So language has something that's called a lexicon. Um, a lexicon lists all its words and all its morphemes. It's also something like a dictionary. And phonology and studies how it's pronounced. Semantics studies what it means. And then you can also look at the distributional properties of language, which would be related to syntax and morphology. Now, what I would like to do right now is, first of all, ask you about your opinion regarding the difference between computational linguistics and natural language processing. Are these just the same? Are they completely equivalent? Is computational linguistic a subpart of natural language processing? Or do those two have nothing to do with each other? For this, I would ask you to go to this address. And let's first do that. If you have any cell phone or any device, please just access this address. Okay. It should say the poll should start soon, right? Sorry. So it's etc.ch slash b5nx. Let me just start this. So the first question is, do you have any experience with NLP? The second one is, do you have any experience with computational linguistics? And do you believe them to be pretty much the same? Mm -hmm. um, there's a message that we should stay tuned for the next question. So I need to continue. Have you all answered the first? Yes. Okay, let's continue to the next. Ready? Okay. Go back to the pole, cat cockpit. Okay. Are we all good? Okay. Okay, so most of you believe that they're not the same. So you think they're very different. Okay, interesting. Let's take a look at what I have to say about it. <laughs> So technically speaking, they're defined differently. So <coughs> computational linguistics is mostly related to the scientific discipline where you look at linguistic processing from a computational perspective. Historically speaking, they're also different because computational linguistics came later. First, there was natural <coughs> language processing, which was very much a computational engineering thing. So it was very much from computer scientists who didn't care much about linguistics. So it was a little bit of a linguistic naivety. Today, it's still somehow defined as an engineering discipline that's more an industry application. And it studies applications that somehow involve language instead of studying language from a computational perspective. So in computational linguistics, you have something like language comprehension and understanding is the big topics, language production and generation and also acquisition. In NLP, you have information retrieval, sentiment analysis, but also virtual assistants and those kind of applications. Now, to be honest, nowadays, this historic difference has somehow a little bit um, mitigated. So mostly they're used interchangeably. The community, if you go to a computational linguistic conference, such as ACL or um, any of these, uh, EMLP, EMN, EMNLP, they would refer to themselves as either computational linguists or NLP people. So it's really used a lot interchangeably. What are the goals of the field in general? There are some really open challenges and big visions, something like natural open domain dialogues, not domain specific, being able to converse in any kind of domain, in any kind of language variety between humans and machines. 
Then there's something like full-scale natural language understanding, which of course is a very, very big topic. You have something like real-time bidirectional speech translation. You just go from one language to another and back, which is something that's being investigated a lot. And there are some nice new models for this uh, as of this year. And then there are some predominant applications that have been proposed over the past years. You have something like a recommender system that is very popular. Sentiment analysis has been investigated at almost every conference related to AI and computational linguistics. Or something like spam detection has also uh, been a very important industry um, application. So why is it hard to do computational linguistics and or NLP? <laughs> um, Techniques that you design for one specific case not necessarily work for another. For one language doesn't work for another language. For one task doesn't work for another task. <coughs> Sorry. It's very ambiguous. Natural language is always very ambiguous. She fed her cat food. Did one person present cat food to the other person as a dinner? Or did one person give food to the cat of another person? So these are both possible. My favorite example that I stole from the people from Stanford, but it's really so nice, it's the Pope's baby steps on gays, which is a real heading of a newspaper article, where of course we understand it immediately as the Pope is slowly becoming more open towards this topic. But if you literally look at it, it's like the Pope's baby that's stepping on gays, right? <laughs> So if you want to do this automatically, your system needs to be able to um, chunk those words together correctly and interpret them correctly. Otherwise, it talks about a Pope's baby. Referencing the Winograd Schema Challenge. Has anyone ever heard about the Winograd Schema Challenge? No? It's supposed to be the new Turing test in AI, okay? kind of. It's about um, combining linguistic knowledge and word knowledge. You have sentences such as, the trophy does not fit into the suitcase because it is too large. And then the question, of course, is what does this it refer to? In order to understand this, you need to <coughs> be aware of the fact that it's the trophy you want to fit into the suitcase and the other way around it wouldn't work. Usually you cannot fit a suitcase into a trophy unless it's a very strange scenario. So this is the reason why this is very hard. You need to understand knowledge about scale. It's not just linguistic knowledge. It's not just resolving pronouns. Then, of course, there is the very, very big issue of compositionality and dependency, as we just saw with the example of the Pope. Humor and sarcasm. People usually like to you know, um, say something in a humorous, ironic, sarcastic way. That's just what I needed today. Probably indicates it's exactly not what you needed today, right? But how is the system able to realize that? And then, of course, there's the whole problem of semantics and pragmatics. Is the meaning literal or is it not? Is it contextual? Do you need context to understand it? Could you tell me how to get to Albert Platz? Yes, I could. Full stop. OK? <laughs> so all the humans can do this, you know, mix the, those two up and just give a literal answer. Like, the literal answer is, yes, I could. Am I going to? OK? So all of these are hard for machines, right? And natural language could be described as the most common user interface in the world. Uh, you have everything in there. You have domain knowledge, linguistic knowledge, discourse knowledge, world knowledge, right? <coughs> so tonight there's uh, Charlie Chaplin in Dresden. For that, you need to understand that it's a movie about Charlie Chaplin that's playing in Dresden tonight. That it's not the person who's dead already, so probably Charlie Chaplin would not be on stage tonight. This is a lot of knowledge that you expect from a machine to understand. So if it does, then it could reply something like, it will play in the concert uh, Konzertsaal im Kulturpalast. But for that, it needs to understand a lot. And if you then ask, when does it play there? There is a lot of referencing. There refers back to the location. It refers to the, to the event. So there's a lot of knowledge that you need to understand and process in order to answer those questions, right? When we look at the normal let's call it pipeline, NLP pipeline, or a computational linguistic pipeline, how you go from having some kind of data to processing, you need to first start to analyze which data you have. If you have something like text, 
you need to maybe do something like OCR, uh, optical character recognition, if it's a PDF or some format that's not directly processable. Then you might want to do something like tokenization segmentation, split your text up into processable chunks, smaller chunks. If you have speech, you first need to do something like phonetic or phonological analysis in order to understand what is being said. It used to be the case that you also needed to transcribe, right? You needed to transcribe speech to something that's text-like. This is something that people work a lot on to avoid the step of having to transcribe anything. I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Once you have this first processing, you go into some kind of syntactic analysis first to understand what are the relations between words. Then if you need it, if you're interested, you might want to do some semantic analysis to understand the meaning of what's being said. And finally, if you want to go even further, you could do something like discourse analysis, understanding the entire text, the entire corpus, a bigger, on a bigger scale, not just sentential, not just sentence level, but bigger level. So let's look at the first one for a moment. Um, if you have phonetic or phono phonological analysis, you need to do some kind of automated speech recognition. So you convert the acoustic sequence into a word sequence. Have you done this a lot already this week? Or a little bit? No? Okay. Um, usually you require some kind, or this is required for current uh, voice user interfaces. Like all of the systems that you've been looking at, like Alexa, Siri, Facebook's M and so on, need to do currently do this somehow. Okay? So what you do is you go from the acoustic signal to some kind of feature extraction. You want to extract the features about what we heard before, aspiration of, um, of characters. You want, to talk, you want to find out about intonation, about strength of, of pronunciation and so on. Then you have some kind of backend, which usually consisted uh, in two, or con still consists mostly, in two models. You first have the acoustic model that really deals with the transcription and the processing of the speech. And then you have the language model that goes into interpretation and uh, prediction, for instance. And then in the end, what you get is some kind of textual word, se word sequence, which is the, highly, the most probable uh, sequence that you've heard, the most probable transcription. This one I don't want to do here, but I would like to do it practically if you're interested. So if you want, you could just go to my GitHub, which is D. Groman, and then go to Viva, and then you should find a Google uh, Colab notebook. If you open this one, I don't know whether you're familiar with this kind of environment. Um, it's a Jupyter note. So are you familiar with Python a little bit? Have you looked at Jupyter notebooks? It's a way of, uh, it's one interface to code in Python basically, where you can combine text and code and you can run code directly in the browser. So for demonstrations and those kind of purposes, it's extremely handy. The advantage of Google Colab is it's not just a notebook that accesses my local machine or your local machine, it uh, accesses the Google service. So everything is installed there already or everything runs there. So you really just need a browser and nothing else, which is why it's quite handy. So I hope this isn't too small and you can see. What I tried to prepare is some kind of practical example of what you usually do when you start processing some text. So this time I um, did it with Spacey, yes? Yeah, sure. So you go to the GitHub, let me go back for a moment. So if you go to my GitHub and you click on Viva, then you click on this NLP syntactic processing mini example. Are we all there? Sorry. D. Groman. So when you're there on the GitHub page, you need to click this button at the very top saying open in Google Colab so that you can run everything yourself and play around with it. You need a Google account for this. I know this is not so nice. <laughs> That's one huge restriction, but it is at the moment the most practical and usable way of doing tutorials so that you can also play around with the code. 
Is it okay? Any problems? Can you open it? So what you need to do first is, of course, install the environment. This is the very first gray box here. All you need to do is click on this little run button, on this little play button. What happens then is it tells you whether you're sure you want to run this or asks you. <laughs> if you say yes, it will download Spacey to your current notebook. What is Spacey? It's a recent, very powerful NLP environment that is extremely easy to use. So it's really NLP for everyone, <laughs> which is why I decided to use it here. Okay. So hopefully it says successful, as it says here. Have you managed to install Spacey? You should see something like this, some kind of output underneath the gray box where it says it's been installed. So the first thing that you need to do when you find some sentence such as welcome to the NLP pipeline in Spacey is you need to find out which elements the sentence has, which smaller units. So the first thing that you usually do when you start natural language processing is you need to do tokenization. In Spacey this is super convenient. All you do is say NLP and then you give it the sentence. Okay, so let's do that. What it tells you as an output is the individual tokens of this sentence. And it also tells you, as a convenience, um, which position they have in the sentence. That's the second number. So position zero is welcome. Position eight, like really space eight, character position eight, uh, starting position is two, that and so on. That's not very exciting for us, but it's something that you need if you want to do further processing. Then the next thing that you can do, let's say you don't have just one sentence, but you have a longer sentence. This is the other very important toolkit that you have in natural language processing. You can either use Spacey, which is extremely nice and usable, or if you prefer to have more control over what's going on or implement your own versions, you can use the natural language toolkit in, in uh, Python. Um, this is import NLTK. That's what you need to do in order to start using NLTK. Okay? I imported here uh, under sentence detection in order to have access to all of these corpora that are already ready-made and uh, available in NLTK. In this case, it's the Gutenberg corpus. Is it working for you? Yeah? Any problems? No. Okay, great. So here we have a selection. <coughs> what I did here by asking it for the file IDs is simply outputting all the text types that you have in this Gutenberg corpus. Okay? So I just looked at what they have. It's mostly literature, because I also um, studied literature a little bit and I really like it. <laughs> and I'm going to select the most cheesy one, uh, Jane Austen, <laughs> for further processing. So here you have a listing of all the corpora, and then in the next little code bit, I'm loading one corpus, which is the Austin Sense and Sensibility corpus. Now let's just take a look at what we get if we load this. What am I doing here? I simply just say I don't want to have the whole text, the whole book. I just want to get the first 1,000 characters. This is what I do by slicing the whole corpus here with this little command. Okay. This just means give me character position 0 until 1000. That's a normal Python thing. This is what it looks like. We have Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen, chapter 1. It's a normal starting point. The family of Dashwood had long been established in Sussex. I'm not going to read the second sentence because it spans over four lines. Okay. So now we have a longer sequence. There's one dummy. Sorry, I should have removed that. There's one dummy code. For, uh, ignore this one. That's just an empty code box. So. If I want to do sentence detection, I can just run this whole excerpt. Um, the difference isn't very big because the sentences are super long. But basically it tells me this is a sentence, there is the next sentence, there is another sentence, and so on. So basically I have uh, uh, an array of sentences now, so I can process it sentence per sentence. This is important also for machine learning because most algorithms don't perform very well on a whole text. You need to break it down into smaller chunks. So sentence segmentation, tokenization are quite important still today. You need to do those usually. Are we all good on this one? So now we, have, we know the tokens, we know the sentences. 
POS tagging, that's the next thing you usually do. Part of speech tagging. Have you ever heard about this? Yeah? It's finding the grammatical uh, categories, the word classes for each word. You want to know whether what you're looking at right now is a verb, a noun, an adjective, a preposition, and so on. So this in uh, Spacey, again, is extremely convenient. All you need to do is just tell it to give you um, the tags. So token text gives us the token, each token. And if you just call token dot tag underscore, you get the POS tags. So it's just once processing if you parse it with this NLP command. And then you can just access all the information you need in it. So it's very fast and very convenient. So the kind of information we have here is sense is a noun. NN just means noun singular. End is a coordination. Okay, Coordinati coordinative conjunction. Sensibility is an NNP, okay, which means it's a proper noun, it thinks. Jane, of course, is a proper noun. This one is correct. Um, why does it think sensibility is a proper noun? What do you think? Because sensibility isn't, yeah? But how should the computer know that it's the title of the book? We haven't given it any world knowledge. It's a very simple, hmm? Capital letter. capital letter. Because in English, you usually only capitalize the first one. So for sense, it's fine with the capital letter because that's at the beginning of the sentence. But for sensibility, it thinks it's a proper noun because it's capitalized. So this is already a problem. So you see, you always need to be careful <laughs> and really know what you're doing because you cannot rely 100% on the output you get. Um, Austin also is a proper noun, so we're good there. It's a name, that's good. Welcome. If you want to know what all of these mean, okay, you can go to this link here. Usually the most common tag set for POS tagging is the pen tree bank. You can just go to this link and then you have a whole listing of what all of these mean. Okay? This is most standard in most POS taggers, even if you use different environments, P uh, the pen tree bank is usually used. So now we know uh, the individual elements and also we know their um, word class. Let's take a look at what's happening here. Now I really want to ask you, what do you think are these based on the text that we saw before? This process here, uh, where we say end.text and end.label, so we get some kind of label here. And it doesn't give us all the words from the text we saw before. It just gives us some words. It gives us Jane Austen, Person, 1811, ordinal, chapter one, it doesn't do anything. It thinks that's not relevant. <laughs> um, it tells us afterwards it's an organization, which probably isn't really true. Um, Dashwood, organization. Sussex is a geographic location, geographical, geopolitical entity, GPE. What could that be? What, what does it give us here? It doesn't give us prepositions, it doesn't give us verbs, it doesn't give us coordinations like and. Any ideas what that would be? What it extracts here? Context in the sense of? Um, what does it mean? Right. So it's about the meaning, yeah? And, yeah? Right? It's about domain specific meaning. So, what do those words mean in this context? And it's called named entity recognition. You try to find named entities because the idea or the theory in linguistics is that those carry a lot of meaning. They're very important in each text. If you just look at the named entities of a text, you can already know a lot about its content. This text is much longer than just those things. But we already know the important people, we know the location, and we know um, organizations, maybe, if, if there are some, and we know the dates. So those are very important pieces of information that can tell you a lot about a text. So this is called named entity recognition, and it's a very important um, analysis process. This already goes a little bit in semantic direction, as you see. It's already related to meaning. It's not just syntax anymore. And what's very nice about Spacey, or what I personally like about it, is yes? Can, is there also a list of the names? Because yes. What is GPE referring to like that? It's geopolitical entity. So like New York City. Exactly, yeah. yes. 
So they differentiate in spaces. So it, this is a very tricky thing. Um, yes, there is. <laughs> there is a list, but those tags are extremely uh, application specific. Yeah. So these are really just spacey. Okay. You have some that you would find in all kind of named entity recognition um, applications, tools. Something like organization, person and date you will find everywhere. But something like geopolitical entity is something that's very specific to Spacey. Others would just call it location. So it really depends on the system. So unfortunately there's no standard, uh, standardly used named entity recognition uh, repository like for, for the POS tags. And so unfortunately, you always need to check it with the application you're working with at the moment. But what is very nice is you can visualize it uh, in the text. So what you can do here is you can just say show me uh, the, the individual named entities in the text so that you can look at them in context in a very nice visual way. Are you still with me? Is it still working for you? Can you play around a bit? Okay. And the final thing that we will do practically before we come back to the presentation is dependency parsing. Now what are the dependencies that you can find in natural language? The most straightforward ones are grammatical ones. Each language has some kind of grammar, some kind of systematic organization of its sentences. So what dependency parsing does is try to find those relations between individual elements. And you can have a textual output of this, but for now, I, just to show it, I went for the visual representation. So here you see really the dependency between individual words. The family, I, here I just chose the very first sentence, okay? I didn't want to output the whole text because then you don't even see the errors anymore, it's too big. So what you see here is just a sentence from position 13 to 24. The style is dependency, so you could also do some other kind of parsing here. There are many different types of syntactic parsing. The most common is dependency parsing, okay? If you do something like um, constituency parsing, you get chunks in a tree format. So there are different ways that you can parse the sentence. Here, you get relations between individual words, okay? So settled is a verb, correct? And this verb relates to family. So who settled? The family settled. This is a dependency between settled and family. Where did they settle? They settled in Sussex. You get those kind of relations. This can be very helpful for lots of applications. I will show you one in a moment. Any questions about this little mini, mini example? Yeah? Um, yes, you can. So for the Vinograd schema, you might need it or for any kind of co-reference resolution. So um, if you want to refer back with a pronoun to the previous sentence, you need to do this. It doesn't work so extremely well, to be very honest. <laughs> yes, it does it. Several systems are able to do it. But to just use a statistic-based dependency parser usually is not a good idea. You would want to use something more advanced. But yes, uh, theoretically, yes. But we have to keep in mind that up to this point, the predominant number of applications is really sentence-based, even in machine learning. It's slowly becoming more and more document similarity, document analysis, and so on. But most of those systems really are very much focused on sentences because that was already hard. <laughs> now we are there, slowly. So now we can focus on discourse analysis, okay? Any other questions about Spacey, the mini tutorial or anything? Okay, good. So this is basically what we did just right now. We didn't do lemmatization. That's something that I omitted for the sake of brevity, 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 for the sake of being short. <laughs> lemmatization just reduces each word to its base form. Talked is reduced to talk or hear. Took is reduced to take. Um, you just try to find the base form. So in this sentence, there's not a lot of telematization going on. But if you have houses, it would re reduce it to house. So you always try to find the one version of a word that you would find in a dictionary. You wouldn't find houses or talked or have been talking or something like that in a dictionary. So it's kind of reducing it to the base form as you would find it in a lexicon or a dictionary. This is extremely useful. Do you have any idea why this could be useful? Why you would want to do lemmatization? Mm, because it reduces the number of different words in your corpus if you want to do machine learning. 
Right. It reduces the number of words. For machine learning, it's actually not so good. Depends on what you want to do. For machine learning, you actually want a variety. You want your machine to learn like a kit, you know, all the different versions. But if you want to do some frequency analysis of some kind of text, you want to find out how often something occurs. If you just do string-based frequency analysis, you're not going to get all the occurrences. For that, you need lemmatization or, or stemming. The difference is lemmatization uses some kind of dictionary in the background. Stemming is the same process, but stemming is a brute force cutting off of the last uh, characters. So usually, uh, lemmatization takes a tiny bit longer, but it is uh, a lot more accurate. But those are the two common processes. Sometimes you want to prefer stemming because 100% accuracy is not so important. But stemming has a problem with, for instance, mouse, mice, no? You cannot cut off anything with mice in order to achieve mouse. So there are some, some things where it's important that you do lemmatization. Okay? For the semantic processing, you will have to deal with a pure presentation because we don't have enough time to do all of this practically today. Um, the named entity recognition we did do practically. So one uh, thing we looked at, one process. Then you can also do something like relation extraction. Now keep in mind, this is a very different type of relation. It's not a grammatical dependency relation. This is really a semantic relation. Berlin is the capital of uh, Germany. Those kind of relations, semantic relations. And which ones you could potentially get from a sentence. Now here we have a grammatical relation again, where you have subject, object, but basically, this is the first step. You first need to find out how, which things are related in general, and then you want to find out which type of relation it is. Those are the two steps that you have in relation uh, extraction. And co-reference resolution is the one thing that you really need for Vinogat schemas, uh, but also in many other contexts. Apple took its annual spring event, so you want to find out what this it refers to. It's who's Apple, okay? You want to do this automatically, which is usually called uh, co-reference resolution. Okay? And then, of course, you can do something like sentiment analysis. Have you ever heard about sentiment analysis? Detecting emotions, polarity, how positive, how negative is someone in view of something. There's a lot of fun things going on in that regard uh, with machine learning. People learned embeddings, which we'll look at in a second and then manage to turn, automatically turn a positive review of a product into a negative one, just by manipulating the dense representation that you learn in a vector format. So that's kind of cool, you can do lots of things here. I'm, not, I'm sure that companies use it the other way around. <laughs> we have a negative review and they turn it into a positive automatically. <laughs> I don't think they would use it this way <coughs> that the researchers did. So this is basically the, the two main pipelines that are traditional NLP pipelines, but that are still very useful today, as you probably have seen now. So it's still, most of these are still being used a lot. How I personally used it, for instance, is you want to find out the cognitive basis of language. You want to find the spatiotemporal relations in language. How can that be useful? There's this one theory that we learn based on our bodily experiences, okay? We move around in space as a kid already, and this forms a lot of what we learn. And the idea is that this also frames our language, how we speak about things. So how can you go back? How can you reverse this development and find those spatiotemporal relations, those cognitive building blocks in language? What we did was first look at the dependency relations. So encourage a country to continue along uh, this road is one example. So what you do is you find out that um, road is directly related to continue. You want to continue along a road. This is a nominal modifier. That's what n mod means. So you always have some kind of tags that have some kind of meaning that you need to find out in linguistics. <laughs> so this is yet another tag set. We had POS tags. We had dependency relation tags. These are also dependency relation tags. Okay? And then uh, you have a case here. So along this road. So those are the things that we found out. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do uh, dependency parsing here? Because prepositions are usually very good spatial indicators. In front, near, above, below, and so on. Really tell, makes a huge difference in the same sentence. So you first want to find out the preposition, but then you need to find out 
um, to which elements in a sentence this preposition belongs to. So we need to find the verb, which probably tells you about the movement that's going on in a sentence. And you also want to find the, uh, what's called the ground, where everything goes, like the goal of the movement. So this is why you need to do dependency parsing. This is why you need to do part of speech tagging. And then we also looked at something that's called semantic roles. Named entity recognition is one type of uh, shallow semantic role labeling. You assign some kind of roles to individual parts of a sentence. But you can do a full-blown semantic role labeling where you really assign meaning to each individual element. So here, uh, if you do this with a very nice tool, um, in this case we used uh, Eleanor, uh, se uh, Eleanor um, semantic role labeling, it's called, from the University of Eleanor. Um, where we get direction for along. It tells us in this situation, the preposition means direction. Prepositions have very different meaning. Like the same preposition can mean radically different things in different contexts. They're super ambiguous, you know. Um, then it tells us that uh, continue is some verb that's related to moving. Okay, it's walking, it's moving, go. And then it tells us that the noun is a way or a path and so on, okay? So what we did was first dissect <laughs> the sentence, then take all this context plus the roles that we found into a vector and throw the whole thing into a machine learning algorithm. Uh, in this case, it was vector clustering because we didn't have any data about this. There was no target data. We didn't know the answer. So deep learning is very hard to do if you don't know the answer already, if you don't have a data set that gives you the answer. Because you need to train those uh, machines like a kit, right? You need to have the input and the answer, basically. That's the most successful case of deep learning. Unsupervised is tricky. Completely unsupervised is very hard. So you can resort to traditional machine learning in order to find some idea about the data. So what we did here was spectral clustering in order to cluster together uh, elements that are related. So here what we found was, for instance, one cluster that all has something to do about continuing along a path automatically, okay? So you want to find all sorts of natural language expressions that have to do with this for the sake of finding examples for certain cognitive building blocks that are called source path goal, okay? I know this is very abstract and very far away from what you're doing, but this is just one example of how you can put several of these processes together to a very different end, to a very different goal. Yes, so it needs to be spatio-temporal both at the same time uh, in order to qualify for this embodied cognition kind of idea, right? So you're really looking for spatio-temporal. Temporal alone um, on Tuesday doesn't give you a lot of movement information, so it's really the combination of both. Continue along a path is spatio-temporal, yeah. So that's kind of the distinction here. So this was a first, so this is quite new, so not a lot has been done on this, especially not automatically. So you needed some kind of first starting point where you find out those spatiotemporal in, uh, spatiotemporal relations. In the long run, you want to do, of course, a full-blown uh, annotation of all information that you find, not just spatiotemporal, but also temporal and so on. As a first indication, you can do that with semantic role labeling. So semantic role labeling will tell you this is temporal information. This is information about how something is done, means, you know. Um, yeah. I went somewhere by car. That should clearly give you, by, should in this case clearly be annotated with means. It's a, it's a means of going somewhere, yeah. One thing that's extremely important and has been extremely influential in linguistics is this idea of meaning can actually be found based on its context. A word, you can identify the word of a meaning purely based on its context. Of course, this is very semantic, yeah, right? It's not pragmatic, it's very semantic meaning we're talking about here but it has influenced uh, computational linguistics and actually several other fields maybe uh, quite a bit. So if you look at this, I, I love this study. So this is a study done by McDonald and Ramska. When the uh, distributional hypothesis was becoming very popular, they decided to do something like a test with humans. They wanted to see whether humans are good on, on a distributional idea. So can you infer the meaning of Balak just by looking at those two sentences? Balak is a nonsense word, it doesn't exist. The man poured from a balak into a handless cup. One does, uh, dispenses tea from a portable balak. 
What do you think Balak could be? Another cup. Another cup? Any other suggestions? Why do you think it's a can and not a cup? Right. And you probably wouldn't describe a cup as portable. It's kind of portable by definition. So just by looking at context, we get an idea. It might be a cup, it might be some, uh, some other vessel. We don't know exactly. There are different versions here. But we do kind of know what it is. It's a container from which you pour. It could be a samovar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah? Yep. You should have said it. <laughs> now let's test this again. Let's change the meaning of Palak. What is it now? It became a round-headed monster, something between a bat and a Balak. The common Balak is a chubby marsupial. I once saw a sloth cuddle a Balak. <laughs> Do you know what a sloth is? It's an Australian animal. They are on trees, they don't move a lot. And it's cuddling. And it's cuddling this balak. Marsupio is a specific classification for an animal. <coughs> Any ideas? It's a kind of marsupi. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it marsupi. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, this is the title <laughs> of an animal in comics. Oh, is it? Uh, yes. Oh, nice. Marsupial, I think it's referring to the oh, no, it's a biological classification of this t a class of animals. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe At least that's where I took it from. I don't know. <laughs> it's a name also used in the comics. Oh, okay, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Yes, it looks a little bit like a tiger, but uh, more thin. Okay. <laughs> so this one is a lot smaller than a tiger because it's a sloth cuddling it. <laughs> I mean, it could try to cuddle a tiger, but that might <laughs> not end well. So, this um, marsupial is something like a, I, I looked it up, white tail. Uh-huh. Um, and it is in Australia, because you said a sloth is an Australian yes. Very small kangaroo. Maybe you haven't heard about this. It's a very uh, Australian-specific animal. It's called a wombat. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this could refer to a wombat, but it could also refer to a kangaroo for all we know, right? But as you see, you can get a very good idea of what Balak might mean in each context just from looking at two sentences. Now, what machine learning does is it looks at tons of sentences for each word and then tries to uncover the meaning of that word and represent all of this meaning, just like we did right now, in a vector. This is called embeddings. And this is the computational um, version today of the distributional hypothesis, where it led to. It led to the idea of vector representations of words. So what you get is you get vector space for words. Each word, based on its contexts, like many, many sentences, is transformed into, a one, into one vector of real valued numbers. It's just a vector with real numbers. And since you do this with each word, you somehow get a vector space where you can place each of those words next to each other. And it has turned out if you do this, then the words that are close to each other relate in meaning. So just by looking at one word, you can determine its meaning if you look at one word and its neighbors. So the neighbor of uh, dialogue, for instance, in the word to vec, which is one of the most popular methods for training those vector representations, is concerning dynamic doctrines, comedy, camera. So not the immediate things that we, that we would think about, but they are related. There are lots of contexts where people use dialogue with these. Because dialogue also has the meaning in of um, computer dialogue, a little dialogue that opens up when you do something in a system, right? So there are several meanings here. You can uh, measure the similarity between two words by just taking those two vectors and putting them into a cosine formula. So you get a cosine distance, and depending on how high that distance is, you know how similar those two words are. This is extremely useful, right? You just want to automatically find out, is this word similar to that one? The one problem with this is it also 
gives you a high similarity for antonyms. So you need to be a bit careful. So good, bad, you know, <laughs> could have the same kind of uh, score as good, excellent. Yeah, so it's a bit, you need to be a bit careful, but in theory it works really well. Not just in theory, also in practice it works really well. Um, one thing that's also important to remember is those embeddings are trained with neural networks, usually very simple ones, something like a feed-forward neural network, and you run like a million iterations over each corpus, okay? You don't just run it through once, you don't just input all your sentences once and then you have your embeddings, uh-uh. You do this many, many, many times. You go forward, you do gradient descent, you do uh, back propagation. This tells you how good your model already performs on the loss function, like how far you are from some kind of minimum, right? Um, so you need to adjust the weights, train again, go back, adjust the weights, train again, and you do that many times. What's the consequence of this? The individual dimensions of each vector have no meaning by themselves. You cannot just take one value from this vector and then think this tells you something. It's really the combination of all the values that tell you something. Now, as I said before, people have turned positive reviews into negative ones. Uh, so you can manipulate them, but you need to manipulate them in a more uh, smart way than just taking one value and another. You really need to interpret first how many of those values need to be changed in order to go from positive to negative. And that has also been done with another uh, deep learning network, yeah. So it's not just, you know, physically taking some values, changing them, <laughs> and then you have a negative. That's not hard to do, because the values don't have a meaning on them, on themsel by themselves. Um, <coughs> what you can do with such embeddings goes beyond just looking at the similarity of words. You can align, have, do you know ontologies? Have you ever heard about ontologies? It's a way of representing knowledge in a structured way. You have classes that represent categories in the world and then relations between those, to put it very, very simple. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there are more refined algorithms to match or find out whether two ontologies align in some way. But one very simple one that we tried is to just use word embeddings. You just take a look at the labels of the ontologies and see how much that helps you to align to. This is extremely useful when it comes to multilingual ontologies because the ontology might always be the same, but you have a lot of information in the multilingual labels. This is <coughs> what we do, did with those two industry classification systems. Industry classification means your company, in which sector do you belong? And there are competing ones in the US and everywhere in the world, like how to classify a company into which category, into which sector of activity. So it's quite useful to align those because then you can compare companies that are classified according to different classifications. You can do this with embeddings. And in this case, we did it with multilingual embeddings. You look at Russian, French, Italian, and then you try to find a better mapping. If those two concepts align in all languages, you have a higher probability that they actually do align. So it's kind of a robustness thing if you do this in a multilingual manner. What I would like you to do now for the next couple of minutes is go to this address, which is a very, very nice visualization <coughs> of word to vec vectors or of those, that vector space that you represent, um, that you learn, basically. And search for the word role. Filter for the 20 nearest neighbors, okay? The 20 words that are closest to that in vector space. And then try to come up with which different types of meanings are encoded in this corpus for role. So let me just go to that page myself. So what you should see is something like this. Then you can search here on this side. You can search for a word here. So let's search for voice. Sorry, let me do that again. So you type something. It gives you the options. You need to select the one you want. Do you want voice? Do you want voices? And so on. And then it keeps on spinning and maybe drives you crazy. <laughs> so two things you can do. First is isolate points. You don't want to see all of them. You want to only see a couple of points. And then if you click on it, it stops spinning. So let's go again. So you search for a word. You click on the word and then it usually spins. Then you can see isolate points. 
you can determine how many points you want to see here in neighbors. And then you can say isolate points again after you adapted the neighbors. And then if you want to stop it from spinning, just click on it and then click on the point again to see the labels. This is how it works. Should I show it again or was it okay? Yes, it's project, projector.tensorflow.org. So once you're there, you have the search on the right-hand side, a little search interface. Just type the word here. We want to look for role. So if you want to go back, just like I did, so let's say I've searched for voice already. And you want to go back because if I type role now, it doesn't give me anything. You need to go back to show all data. Okay? And then I can search again. small. Yeah, <laughs> this doesn't help. Yeah. Okay. It's just a way to play around with embeddings, get an idea of what are the neighbors. I think it's a nice visualization. So here you have role. And then you have a listing of some of the closest neighbors on the right-hand side. So here we get cargo, passengers, rolls, fame, petroleum, inducted, load, dice, and so on, load, dice, and so on. And then you can also look at the ones here. And maybe let's reduce it to the 20 if you're interested in. So this is something, yes, it's 300 dimensions usually. So they, uh, there have been a lot of experiments on this, uh, which dimensionality works best. And for this particular method, which is called word to vec, so to how to go from word to vector, 300 has turned out to work best. There are other uh, libraries like FastTax, which is uh, an alternative method, where 100 worked almost as, as good as 300. So you have uh, lower dimensionality which of course makes everything faster, right? You, you work with fewer um, values. But for word to work, 300 has been the thing. Now what do we see here? This is called, one method is called principal component analysis. You reduce each vector to its three principal components in order to visualize it. This works well enough to, to analyze, visually analyze its closest neighbors. Yeah. So any ideas? What are the meanings that we can see here? We have Barrel, guns, load, petroleum, livestock, rock, drop. Oh, right, so that's a, that's a nice one, no? <laughs> so when you look for roll, you suddenly get rock because it's rock and roll. I guess the dice is pretty straightforward as well. Do we have it here? No. That's one of the small ones, maybe. You roll a dice, no? So some of them are rather straightforward. Some of them are a bit more obscure, right? You sometimes even need to look, uh, look it up in Google, how roll might relate to drop or guns. So roll for a gun could be something like a uh, component of a gun, no? Or how a, um, what's the name of that? A bullet rolls out of a gun. <laughs> but you really sometimes need to look at the context and what was used to train it in order to find out the meanings. When you look for 
wolf you suddenly get, for instance, Ferrari. No? Why would you get Ferrari when you look for wolf? Because there's this person called Wolf Ferrari. <laughs> so sometimes really you need to look it up in order to figure out what it means. But I just wanted to show you this so that you can play around with it, take a look a little bit at what's in vector space, what things relate to what. And what's the fascinating thing about this whole uh, vector space that you get in the end is you can navigate through it. So if I take the vector for man and I say minus, um, hold on, how was that? If I take the vector of king and say minus man, so I take away the manliness of the king, and I add femaleness, so I say king minus man plus woman, do you know which vector you get in the end? Because this is mathematical vector operations. So I just take the vector for king, I subtract man, and I add woman, like the vector for woman. What do you think you get? Which, which vector is closest to that vector that we just mathematically produced? Queen. So this is how it works. You can do analogies, which are really nice, and that's very useful, right? So this is something that people have played around with a lot as well. And if you want to, that's a lot of fun to play around with, what you can get with those analogies. Okay? Good. So this is super important. Vectors are extremely important. In any kind of natural language related task nowadays, you use embeddings. There's not a single, okay, maybe there are, but I'm not aware of a single deep learning application that does not use word embeddings. Usually you even use word pre-trained word embeddings because there's a lot of semantic information already you start out with. So once I input my new corpus, my new data, it adds to the data that's already there, to the semantics you already have which makes the application much more accurate. Okay? So it's very common to use those word embeddings. Do you understand what they are and how this works a little bit? It's basically when you train the whole thing, you input a dummy vector representation of each word. It's called a one-hot encoding. And you have a one at the position of the word that you're currently inputting. Okay? And the rest is zeros. This is how you get text into a machine learning, into a deep learning only um, algorithm. And then the embeddings is what is trained on the hidden layer, the weight matrix that you train by going over and over and over again. This is what the word embeddings are. So you really train the whole that matrix, the whole context of all words at the same time, each time you input. That's why the individual dimensions don't really have a meaning. So let's come to the more interesting, more recent things. Why has computational linguistics become quite popular and quite has exploded quite in research? More and more people go there. Um, well, you have computational power now that you did not have before. So deep learning was invented in neural networks, were invented in the 40s and 50s, but no one could do anything with it because there just wasn't enough computational power. Now we have it and now we can do lots of nice things with it. Suddenly, lots of linguistic data became available. More and more people were annotating, putting lots of manual effort, especially at the end of the last century. Lots of groups put a lot of ma manual effort into annotating, procuring high quality data. And then there's something like the linked data consortium, a linguistic data consortium, and the, linked, uh, li the linguistic linked open data uh, group. So lots of um, researchers and companies came together to form those groups and make sure that there are enough data that you can do all of these processes and that you can train models. And of course, machine learning algorithms suddenly became super uh, successful, super accurate. So this boosted the whole field, uh, field a lot. Suddenly, speech recognition actually worked a lot better than before. So you could really use it in industry even. So all of these really boosted the whole field. We got a much richer understanding of human language. With a globalization, you have more contact to other languages, you have the internet, it's so easy to access information. All of this really helped computational linguistics. And the idea of shared tasks. This is something where researchers come together and compete in some kind of task. Okay? So you have a relation extraction task where everyone tries to uh, uncover semantic relations in text. So lots of different groups hand in their solutions, their systems, and compete against each other. This is, like a, this is called a shared task. So this really helped provide more robust solutions, better solutions. 
The two things that I would like to talk to you about for the rest of my uh, morning lecture is machine translation and conversational assistance <coughs> in uh, voice operated in voice yeah voice operated assistance. Now machine translation is the most important way that machines can help human to human communication. It's not human machine, it's really how can a machine help human to human communication. There used to be rule based and statistical methods that already work to some extent. It's not like they didn't work, uh, but it's just that deep learning worked so much better. <laughs> um, one architecture, do you, how much do you know about deep learning? Have you learned a little bit about this in the past or this week? Do you know about the architectures, the different, if not, then just ignore this information. If you do, transformers are the things that are being used right now. <laughs> I don't have time to go into the details of what a uh, transformer is as opposed to a convolutional neural network or a recurrent neural network. But yes, transformers are the big thing right now in machine translation. Uh, what they do is, it's a very simple network, and then you have a mechanism in the middle that puts the spotlight on certain elements of the text. So you say, this word is most important for what I'm looking at right now. So that really helped a lot. Um, and there are lots of shared tasks, such as the machine translation robustness task that was at ACL this year, where it was really about how machine translation can handle noisy data. Because people are not first language speakers, so they produce grammatically incorrect sentences on the web. Um, things are cut off for some reason in some processing, the data is just not clean and perfect. How can machine translation work well even though the data is not perfect? So this is an interesting challenge, no? And they did this for French, English and Japanese to English translations. <laughs> so one very interesting finding of machine translation over the last years was this zero-shot translation by um, Google that I would like to talk to you about. They trained a system to translate from English to Japanese, from Japanese to English, and then suddenly, and also from, so let me start this again, just a second. So they trained from English to Korean, <laughs> from Korean to English, from English to Japanese, and from Japanese to English. So there was no direct training Japanese, Korean. But what happened? The model suddenly could translate from Japanese to Korean, even though it was never trained on it. That was like a serendipitous finding. It wasn't something they planned. It was just suddenly their system could do it. This is something that they published uh, with the name of zero-shot translation. Because it's zero-shot, you do nothing. Like, you don't train it, it suddenly can translate another language pair. That's very nice, no? <laughs> of course, neural networks, deep learning, eight layers, deep architecture, uh, Google neural machine translation model. But you cannot only translate language. So I would like to show to you just for a moment that you can also translate from natural language to structured knowledge with those models, using the same kind of models. What we did here in Dresden actually with a student was automatically translate from natural language to a structured query language. Have you heard about Sparkle before? Do you know SQL, SQL? Yeah? So it's basically the same for graph databases. It has a slightly different syntax because you need to consider the structure of a graph database, but it's the same idea. It's just a query language for graph databases. This can be very useful because people don't need to learn Sparkle. If you can just input your natural language question, then uh, you can submit your query without having to uh, go through learning Sparkle and typing your Sparkle query. And that worked extremely well. Like those, so what we did, we compared all the existing best performing machine translation models. And it was really surprising. It worked so much better than from natural language to natural language. Limited data set, you need big data sets, of course. You know, it's always the same story. Like you couldn't just ask any question. It's a certain type of question you can ask with this kind of system. Okay. What's even more interesting is there's also something that's direct speech to speech translation. As we said before, you usually need to go from speech to text and then from text to speech again in another language. Um, the translatortron is an approach where you go directly from speech to speech. You don't do this uh, detour via transcriptions anymore. You don't transcribe the text at all. You have an encoder stack that gets the Spanish uh, audio information. 
You parse it through the whole network where you can see attention is important again. Put the spotlight on the important words. And you generate the English audio output without any text in between. That's the idea. And what's funny about this whole idea is that they also tried to replicate the voice of the initial speaker. So let's listen to that for a second. This is the Spanish input. Sorry, I, need, I cannot <laughs> click twice. Okay. And the English? Larry asked me how I felt, and I think it's when I started to cry. So it's trying to, it's not so great yet, it's very new, it just came out uh, a few months ago. Uh, but it already tries to replicate the voice of the speaker. So there's some mistake if you speak Spanish. Uh, it actually says, the Spanish says, Larry asked me how I felt. And the uh, translation says, Larry asked you how I felt. Okay? So there's some, some small uh, problems still, but I think it's very impressing, I mean, impressive. Sorry. So this is done without any transcription at all. If you're interested, take a look at the paper. I have the references at the end for all of this. Um, the second big uh, task that we will look at is conversational agents and NLP and computational linguistics. This is human-machine interaction. This is not human-to-human -human interaction. Of course, the NLP pipeline, as presented before, has been used a lot in this uh, direction for IBM. The IBM's Watson, they used a lot of natural language understanding, NLP pipelines and traditional methods. And there are also some nice challenges that um, try to boost the area. There's the very famous uh, Alexa Price. Have you heard about that? Yeah. So then I will just skip that. <laughs> so they just started a new one. Uh, the teams have only just been elect elected, but probably you know. So this is interesting if you're in this field. You probably know about this as well, right? Just the base architecture of a dialect system. You go from text to speech synthesis. Uh, sorry, you go from automated speech recognition to a dialogue manager to text to speech synthesis. Maybe you have a natural language understanding unit. Maybe you have some kind of knowledge base or response generator in this as well. But this is kind of the very basic thing. What has been a breakthrough is replacing this whole idea of an acoustic feature modeling, where you go from speech to some feature extraction by deep learning. Because machine learning, traditional one, needs features. You need to extract features first and give features to your, um, to your model. Deep learning doesn't need that. It just needs raw input, sentences, speech. You can give it directly to the deep learning model. So this is one of the breakthroughs. And one very, very recent paper, which I think is quite interesting, is the idea of Google to train embeddings that are specific to acoustic and paralinguistic information. So you don't train, on, train it on words like we saw before but you try to drain acoustic embeddings straight away so that each of those vectors represents uh, one element of speech. This was presented uh, two weeks ago at the Interspeech 2019 in Graz. And I think it's one interesting approach. There are many. I just chose this one because we were talking about embeddings earlier. So instead of doing this whole acoustic feature extraction manually, they just tried to train those acoustic embeddings in order to do intent detection. detection in order to find out uh, what's the intention, what's the intent of something spoken. And they also added emotion embeddings to this, because otherwise it's very di uh, difficult to find out the uh, intent of a speaker. No? So they combined those acoustic paralinguistic embeddings with emotion embeddings. And it could substantially reduce the overall error rate okay, for this specific task of intent detection. They claim by 60%. So as you see, it's all uh, deep learning. It's all long, short-term memory-based, LSTM-based in this case. And you combine uh, the acoustic and emotion embeddings with the neural networks in order to get the expression detection. This is kind of how it works. I don't have time to go into details because I'm already running almost out of time. So I will just continue. So what's still open? What's still an open problem uh, in computational linguistics? What are the current trends and challenges? As you can guess by the title of my talk, uh, language variety <laughs> and domain-specific contents are very important. You have very few solutions for low-resource machine translation, low-resource language conversational agents. 
Like how many conversational agents are there for Indonesian or, or Khmer that they speak in Cambodia, right? So this is definitely an open problem. And what about domains? It might work really well in, an op in a general domain, but what if you talk about medical concepts? Does it still work that well? Like, can you talk to Alexa about medical concepts? Maybe some, but maybe not all. <laughs> so English is not English. You have orthographic differences, dialogue versus dialogue. You have lexical differences, sneakers, trainers, American English, British English, or British English American. Collective nouns could be one difference, which it is in English. You have the team is playing tonight is the American version, whereas a British person might say the team are playing tonight, because you consider team as a collective of people, so you can also say are. An American would never say the people are uh, the team are uh, playing tonight. You have auxiliary words that you only use in one variety. Should we go now? Shall we go now? Okay, it's a huge difference. In machine translation, it's fun to play around with language varieties. This is a version of Austrian German, because <laughs> I'm from Austria. <laughs> so the first one is super bad dialect. It's a, it's a poem in dialect. It basically says, you understand it? Some of you, if you speak German, so it's kind of, I'm standing in front of the mirror in the, in the I'm standing in front of, in, in my bathroom and look into the mirror and that what's looking back at me must be an Adonis, you know, okay. So it doesn't understand anything, like this is supposed to be bathroom, it gives you something like a bedroom, which doesn't mean anything at all. So real dialect is impossible, it just doesn't work. But also if you look at not just dialect, but also terminology. We do not say Mülleimer in Austria. It's just not something you say. You say Miskiewer. And it cannot do that. It's <laughs> Dung Bucket, which basically <laughs> means <laughs> it's something from the countryside, you know. Um, this is something you eat. Mannerschnitten. If you've ever been to Vienna, you see it everywhere, right? This is something you eat. It's a sweet thing you can eat. It's not cuts. <laughs> and this is something I had to look up myself. I didn't even know what it means. It's like if you go to a school, you know, um, you go with those little little um, blackboards, you know, and right, yeah. So this is what a Tafelklassler means. It tries to at least put it into plural. It says Tafelklasslers. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> when you look at domain-specific contexts, it gets even worse. So if you go from English to German, Foreclosure law is uh, translated to Zwangsversteigerungsgesetz. Uh, that doesn't exist in any variety. You have Exekutionsrecht in Austria, Zwangsvollstreckungsrecht in Germany, and then you have something like the Schuldbetreibungs- und Konkursrecht in, in Swiss German. So it had three chances, but it didn't get any of them. Okay? So terminology is also a big problem. It's not just about dialect and, and informal speech. And when it comes to... Uh, conversational AI, it gets even worse. Do you know that one? Do you know the Scottish? Do all of you know it already? Have you seen it this week? Then let me play it again because it's really nice, no? Please speak slowly and clearly. <laughs> eleven. 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 Does it 
<laughs> Sorry, uh, the link is there if you want to if you want to take a look at it you can just take a look at the full thing it just goes on for a little bit more and they get very crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what do we learn from this? Don't do worse voice recognition in Scotland. <laughs> no, <laughs> that language varieties are important also for speech recognition and they haven't been yet considered enough neither in machine translation nor uh, in, in um, voice recognition or speech recognition. Sorry. So what are the next steps from my very humble and very computational linguistic viewpoint? Um, multimodal everything, also dialogue systems. There is a whole lot of promise in combining visual, uh, audio and textual information. It holds the promise of having a more full semantic representation because these are the channels that we as people have. You don't just listen to me, you don't just hear my voice, you also have the text and you also see what's going on, you see my gestures and so on. So I think the promise of combining different modalities is that you have a more complete picture of semantics. Also combining technologies related to respective channels, okay? Um, automated speech recognition with image segmentation and recognition could be a thing. And I think that personal assistants will also find some broader usage in uh, educational and medical assistance, or should find some broader, broader usage, you know, in educational assist assistance, and also in security access control, which is also something that's an ongoing um, research. Now, when I talk about multimodal, and this is the last thing that I will uh, tell you today, I don't just mean audio, video and text, there's a lot more to multimodal. For instance, there's this beautiful, very, very recent paper about speech synthesis algorithms where based on auditory input, like the neural activities after auditory input, a system could produce the text to what it heard, to what a person heard. So this is uh, thought to speech multimodal. <laughs> so people were uh, listened to audio input and the model looked at their neural activities while they listened to this input and had to reproduce the text that they were listening to. This is pretty cool, no? It's like brain interfaces. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot you can do with multimodal. You know, when you think multimodal, don't just think about, you know, the usual channels. There's a lot you can do here. And that was the last thing I wanted to leave with you. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Trained model that you can just, just ready to use. 
I always have a feeling like there are like only task specific domains specific data sets and solutions for it, you know, not for, for the language at all. So is there a German tool for sentiment analysis, right, Nate, that you can just plug into speech? Um, I'm not aware of a German specific sentiment analysis tool, but there are a couple of sentiment analysis tools that work really well on text. Now the problem is that doesn't help you much with speech systems unless you want to go the transcription way. Yeah, I'm, I would go the transcription way, okay. so since we have text anyway. I think, um, uh, first of all, you can try Spacey for real because it has a lot of uh, German support and it has sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. And it's the most easy to use tool. And it's not so bad on accuracy. Uh, another easy to use tool, as far as I'm aware, I think it's called Veda, um, where you can also do sentiment analysis. But my personal problem is always, I'm a computational linguist, so everything I do is like programmed. <laughs> so you always put your solutions together yourself that you need. You know? mm -hmm. So I'm also good on, you know, ready-made usable tools that are out there. Okay, so sorry, yeah. I keep repeating that as well. Quite interesting if um, um, yeah, speech synthesis as well, not only possible, not only able to uh, mirror some basic voice um, characteristics, mm -hmm. but as well for dialogue. Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. If you could model dialogue in those, it's actually really good. Actually, you might also want to take a look, sorry, I just remember that, at the emotion embeddings that you use in the, in the Google paper at Interspeech, where they combine uh, interlingual, uh, sorry, paralinguistic, acoustic embeddings and emotion embeddings. Yeah. So I think one very good way of, of uh, going in that direction is using embeddings as well, emotion. Yeah. And those are pre trained. Ah, okay. Yeah. So they also publish. The yes, example. yes. So to find uh, repositories of embeddings is not so hard. You just need to look for the method. So if you want to get fast text embeddings, search for fast text embeddings, pre-trained fast text embeddings. You find actually a lot of embeddings in many different languages. But this is not sentiment specific. So you need to look for emotions embeddings, emotion embeddings if you want to have something more specific. Yeah. Any other ideas, complaints, questions, suggestions? Yeah? And so this week we were only able to, to um, prepare dialogues. Alexa or Micro, mm -hmm. and it's very easy for the whole population to do so if you start a little bit of learning with this. But um, you mentioned the question if we already talked about um, this natural language understanding mm -hmm. and the, all the steps before, um, the, the audio files, etc., it is not possible for us here in this job. Mm -hmm. Where do you think this will become possible and useful for non people or to develop skills or something? Where do you find this information so that you can Will they ever start, they always start from the point of the text that is already translated mm -hmm. by Amazon or whoever? Mm -hmm. Or will they at some, in some day start earlier with this development process and change some so the model the API starts after the intent has been recognized. Right. Uh, and that's what the question is really, is there, can we expect that the APIs will provide some, let's say, information from uh, understanding word classes, link entities, ah, and right. things like this. Or whether you can do an LLP pipeline with speech. This seems to be very complicated, so. Yes, yes. Will indeed. we ever do something in this part of this whole process? It's not something I'm aware people are, are uh, doing it, but actually, why not? I mean, this is something that you should definitely do. That you can do an identity recognition of speech directly, you know? That would be very cool. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I honestly hope that this will be possible, that you do something like a speech NLP pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, the point is really the architecture of such a system. Yeah. Uh, because uh, the, the practical study of the dialogue, the HCI topic maybe, mm -hmm. uh, needs to be based on a better understanding of, of, of what was being said. We, we heard a lot about uh, the human's view on an artificial intelligence concept. So therefore, you would like to have more information than just the intent that was selected by people right. or and, uh, and as a, so how you can so get more information? Synchronized right. Because you are fighting nowadays with big companies in some way. Mm -hmm. Either you can repeat their efforts yes. or you can do small bits and pieces. But never a whole system that has the ability to run a dialogue. Um, right. That's a bit of a problem. I mean... They're partnering, but I don't see a lot of partnering in <laughs> 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 <There we are. laughs> uh, No, linguistic people are partnering to create resources. No? So that was a huge, yeah. That was a huge uh, effort, and there are lots of consortiums doing that. 
a full dialogue system from a research perspective is also hard, you know, to compete with those data, to compete with companies who have so many experts in so many fields working on this, plus the engineers. With the university, like most groups don't have both, you don't have uh, researchers and a full-blown team of engineers who really put it to practice, you know, proof of concept implementations and research, no? As opposed to uh, full-blown industry, that's a huge, that's a big step. So, I think for research to do this, it's very hard, unless you're at Facebook, Amazon, and Google Research. But yeah, in the end, it would be very interesting. And one thing that I think is promising, and something that research can do for sure, is bring more of traditional um, methods into deep learning. As you saw a little bit, I'm very interested in you know, combining structured knowledge representation with deep learning. Anyway, you know, either, either to learn it, but also to use it as an input in the training process like guide the decisions of a dialogue system based on deep learning on the basis of ontologies, on the basis of things that we've modeled in the world before. This is something that's very interesting and very promising. And it has actually already shown some improvements if you do this. Like how can you combine, you know, classical formal knowledge representation with the new trend of deep learning? Does that kind of relate to, yeah? All right. So thank you. Okay. Thank you.